We are uh, live here, and I uh, just wanted to start out with, um, you know, this is an audio recording just to uh, keep track of some of your memories of the war, and name? we're going to start with you perhaps introduce yourself and your name. Uh, this is Joe Lennon, and with Michael Manco and Avery Manco, and... and I am Bill Manco. And, uh, you know, maybe start with, you know, your... Um, place of birth and, and when you were born and where you were from. Uh, okay, I was born in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, which is up in the coal regions of Pennsylvania. And um, I spent my youth there with happy memories with my brother Michael. And after that, I. What year were you born? What year was I born? October the 26th, 1922, if that, was, if that's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I graduated from J.W. Cooper High School in Shenandoah at the ripe old age of 16. That was because I had skipped a grade and the following fall I was enrolled in Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. I spent my great years there. I was also a member of Phi Gamma Delta fraternity. If you're familiar with that fraternity, one of the best. And then came a time when I was nearing graduation and World War II uh, was starting. I enlisted in the enlisted reserve with the promise that I would be going along with my other colleagues and uh, graduates to officer training school. That did not happen. We were, we were, I was uh, graduated, went back to Shenandoah, and I remember my father and I guess my brother, maybe my mother, taking me up to what was then known as the Hotel Ferguson, got onto a bus. And off I went to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, where my journey in World War II began. And what year was this? Uh, 1943, I guess. 43, okay. Yeah, 43. And you graduated from college early, correct? Yes, I, I, it was an accelerated program. About a semester early, I graduated. So you graduated in 42? 43. 43 from 43. Bucknell. Okay. February of 43. For February, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, after my uh, induction period in Indian Town Gap, I was sent to Camp Croft in South Carolina, although my brother doubts that. He doesn't think of South Carolina, but I think pretty sure it was South Carolina. And the one thing I remember about the basic training was the accelerated mode we were in, which should have given us a, an idea of what was going to happen. But uh, South Carolina was known for its very durable, hard clay, hard red clay. Now what do I know about hard red clay? I had to learn how to dig foxholes in the red clay of South Carolina. After South Carolina, we went to Newport News, Virginia, boarded a troop ship, and went off to overseas duty. How long were you on the troop ship for? I would say two or three days, because we, uh, my first port of call was Casablanca, North Africa. My uh, memory of that stop was to look overboard and see the seven foot tall Sengalese soldiers in their high top socks, shorts, and fez caps, and a bayonet that was as long as your arm on the top of their old rifle. And as I said to my friends standing alongside of me, what the hell are we doing here? Uh, 
after we got off the ship, we started what was known as a overland journey through North Africa and we boarded French French uh, trains French trains that uh, were known as 40 men and 8 horses. Now if my French is correct that would have been 40 chevaux et 8 homes. Homes. Not bad. No, pretty good for French. That the journey was an arduous one because it was very close. We had our equipment. We had a rifle and a backpack. And it was very difficult in those days because we had very little room to uh, accommodate ourselves. One of the, <coughs> the uh, experiences I remember, the Arabs in the area, when the train came to a halt at any particular place, they would jump up on board on the railing and try to sell us their melons, which uh, was a treat for us because where were you going to get fresh fruit in those days? And then the train would take off again and I, I remember getting to a place called Oran, O-R-A-N. That was a port city. I believe that's, that's in where Algeria. I Pardon? I believe that's in Algeria. Yes, it was. It's Algeria. That's where I joined the 1st Infantry Division. Let me match. So before that time, you didn't have an assigned unit? Or? No, we were, we were replacements. Okay. We were replacement soldiers. And I hearkened back to the time at Bucknell where they told us we were going to officer training school. But because of the need for soldiers, we were shipped as soldier replacements. And I joined the 1st Infantry Division, and this is my patch which I wore uh, throughout my... Bring it closer. There we go. All right. Throughout my service with the 1st Infantry Division. In Oran, we were told we were going to go to Sicily. And that's where I first experienced combat. We were to rout the Italians and the Germans who were dug in in hills overlooking the city of Palermo in Sicily. And uh, the combat there was short-lived because the Italians were told to stay there and cover the Germans' retreat. And as soon as uh, we got into the hills and started shooting at them, they surrendered. Uh, after a short period of time in and around Palermo, Sicily, I remember meeting General George Patton, who gathered the troops and told them that we were going to go to England to train for the invasion of France. Uncle Bill, how long were you in uh, Sicily? How long was that whole thing here? Days or weeks? Or months? A month. A <coughs> month or a so. Month. Maybe, a, maybe a two months. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we went back from Palermo, Sicily to Oran, where we boarded a troop ship. And that proved to be a very hazardous trip across the ocean because the captain of our troop ship told us that we were being shadowed 
by a German submarine. Fortunately for us, our troop ship was faster than the submarine, and we were told this on the loudspeaker system, so he zigzagged his way across the Atlantic Ocean and finally when we neared the shores of Scotland the RAF, that is the British Air Force, came out and met us and we all shouted and yelled for joy because at that point the German submarine <coughs> turned around and left us and the RAF went after the German submarine. I don't know what happened to that submarine, but they were going after him and dropping bombs on him. So we landed at Glasgow, Scotland. We were transported to a city called Coventry, Coventry, England, which was one of the targets of the German Buzz bombs, I think they were called. Right, the V1 <coughs> yeah. buzz bomb. Mm -hmm. Buzz bombs. And that city took a tremendous shellacking from the bombs. I remember whatever lead we had, we would go into town, and a lot of the buildings were just damaged very badly. The people of uh, Coventry were very generous and friendly and one thing I remember on whenever we had a time off we would go into one of the English tea rooms where they served muffins and scones and tea and we had a lot of money and they didn't the English didn't so the first thing you would know, the American soldiers looking for something different than their glorious spam, which was made, which is a, a form of ham in a can. We would go in and help ourselves pay for the scones and the tea biscuits and the tea and clean out the b little shop much of the dismay of the English people because they didn't participate in their afternoon tea. Now what, what was your uh, what was your rank at this point? Are you a, a, I was a private, private? Okay. Private first class, I think. I and and most of the American privates had more money than the English. some of the British officers. I, yes, I think yes, were yes. the pay was. We had uh, we, so to speak. We had money to burn. Right. Were, were you the uh, the only uh, college graduate, private first class? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not. Uh, because I was in a group that were college men. And we were all supposed, as I said previously, supposed to go to uh, officer training school. I know there was a question that one of you wanted to ask me. Is, did I have the opportunity to become an officer? And I did but it was taken away from me. I'm going to jump ahead to answer that question, the second part of that question. In the Hurtgen Forest <clears throat> in Germany was vicious fighting and many of the officers were killed. And higher ranking officers, what we call field officers, major and above, were coming through the field and saying, you soldier, you're now lieutenant. And I and I and my friend that I was fighting with at the time said, No, I'm not. I'm gonna survive this. Because so many of those officers were the German targets were to kill the officers. And they were very successful at that. So I did have two opportunities to become an officer. One was taken away from me and one I rejected. And I think that what saved me in the, in the end because I survived. But now to get back to Coventry, England, we underwent very hard training and what, one of the things that we were trying to do is become physically fit because we knew 
that what was ahead of us would be a strain on our physique and our bodies. So we did work hard. One of the things I remember in England after we had some time off beside the scones was fish and chips. I want to tell you something. To me that was one of the greatest delicacies in the world. <laughs> they were very, very good. I don't know what kind of fish that was. And the chips were some form of a French fry, but they weren't French fries. They were sort of a home fried potato. And the, the English would, would make a container out of a newspaper in the form of a cone, put the fish and the chips in the cone, and there you were. You had a delicious little tidbit that the English were famous for. And I brought that dish over here to the United States and it didn't succeed, really succeed. Uh, I think there was a gentleman by the name of Sir Arthur Treacher who brought that uh, fish and chips to the United States and it succeeded for a while but the Americans were more interested in hot dogs. All right, after Coventry We went down to a seaport, and I really don't remember the name of that seaport. It probably was on the English coast somewhere. I don't remember that. Don't remember the seaport. This, the seaport where we land, where we boarded LSTs. Actually, we boarded a a transport that had the LSTs on them and then as the transport approached this was D-Day and I was, I was with the 26th Regiment 1st Infantry Division that made I was in the second wave this was June 6, 1944 D-Day and we landed on Omaha Beach, but before I get to that, the LST, as it approached navigable waters, we got orders to be ready to disembark and to watch out for yourselves because we don't know what to expect even though the first wave suffered tremendous losses and we saw some of them. It was a terrible sight to see. As I, get, I told this story to my brother and his son Avery, my brother Michael and his son Avery, and I'm going to tell it to Joe, uh, Joe Lennon here. As I stepped off the LST, I stepped into a hole in the sand, in the beach, and it went down over my head. And with all the weight I had on me, with the backpack and the M1 rifle, which was a heavy gun, heavy rifle, I was down underwater and taking on water, just gobbling the water, and some GI in back of me got me by the scuff of the neck and the sh pants and shoulders and shoved me forward, and he saved my life because I was heavily weighed down and taking on water, as they say. Anyhow, I finally got to the point where I could get my feet on the ground and we got to the beach and we were told to go follow the path up alongside the bunkers to the top of the hill which was uh, difficult, it was difficult because we could still hear shooting in the distance. Were you they know? shooting at you? No, no they weren't. Maybe some snipers were. But, but you heard, you, you heard a heard, lot of shots. I heard shots, yeah. Do you know what time of day this was? It was daylight. Like uh, Later in the afternoon? No, in the morning. In the dawn in the morning, okay. Yeah. And uh, we got to the top of the hill, we, then we passed the bunkers. The bunkers were heavily fortified concrete embattlements, so to speak with these big German guns sticking out 
and shooting at our troops and our naval ships. But at that time, they, the only thing we would see were dead soldiers, dead German soldiers. Then there was another question that I remember somebody asking me, of this group that's interviewing me, when did I first see combat in France? It was shortly after I got to the top of that hill that we fought in San Lo. And that was combat. I was shooting. At that point, the Germans were retreating. They were not st staying put too much because we had a, a big force besides the 1st Infantry Division. There was another division. I think it was the 29th. I'm not sure. I had a lot of friends from... I'm a resident of Maryland now, and I, I had a lot of World War II vets who were with the 29th Division coming from Maryland. It was the 29th. was 29th. Same thing on Omaha Beach. Yeah. First and 29th. So, my memory is not too bad after all. <laughs> uh, Air support at that time? Planes flying over? Yes. Yes, but they didn't spend much time where we were. They seemed to be going further inland. Uh, you might have heard of what they call hedgerow fighting. Now that means in the French countryside there were these hedgerows delineating property lines. And uh, we would crouch down along those hedgerows and our orders were to keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. And there were times when you thought you could never move another inch. You were so exhausted. And when they gave you a break, you just flopped down on the ground and almost fell asleep there. And then they gave you maybe five minutes. And a sergeant would bark, bark out, get up! move and we did how tall were these hedgerows i would say they were about the height of your head do they vary in height some are smaller than others and some are bigger uh, they than were others? pretty much uh, average height about mm -hmm. all along uh, france and that was uh, that was our experience now there came a time when we got past france Oh, one other little incident. You know, when you're in in combat and uh, you're moving, you get you get these rations that they give you and little little tins of food and crackers, and they always gave us some cigarettes. I don't know why, but they did. But anyhow. That was what you would eat. You would open up those tins of canned food and crackers. And so after a while you got sick of that and you would stop at a French farmhouse. And some of us know a little bit of French. We would say, Avez-vous des oeufs? Do you have any eggs? And they had very little because the Germans, as they were departing, took whatever eggs they could get off the French farmers. But the farmers, knowing we were their liberators, tried to help us out. So when we would get some of those eggs, we would have take our steel helmet off, start a fire, and cook the eggs, eggs in the steel helmet. So we had scrambled eggs a la France, uh, which was a treat. And then they would give us some bread maybe, but they were, the French people were very generous, but they had nothing. The Germans, as they retreated, took a lot of their food staples with them so they could sustain themselves as they were going back to Germany. Now, after we left France, we got into the French-Belgium border, as I recall. 
And it was in that area. Oh, one more thing. It wasn't too long after we got through San Lo that we met up with General Patton's 3rd Armored Division. And General Patton was determined to cut the German troops off from reaching the homeland. We captured an awful lot of soldiers in that particular time. Who the, a lot of them were civilian soldiers and they had had it when the jig was up, so to speak, they quit. We, and I remember one time an officer came to me and said, you soldier, watch these troops and move them back to the rear. And I estimated there were at least 150 to 200 soldiers. And I thought, how am I going to watch 250 soldiers <laughs> with an M1 rifle? And you had to be very careful because intermixed with the civilian soldiers were the SS troops and the paratroopers, German paratroopers who were the bad guys in the German army. And they had their overcoats on and we would tell them to disarm themselves. And what we had to be careful was we had this experience where some of our soldiers and the goodness of their nature trust that these German soldiers, usually SS men, and they would pull out a hand grenade from their coat, take the pin out and hand it to the American soldier and blow them to bits. So that's a terrible thing to say, but that's what happened. So that was one of my duties at that particular time, and I was very careful to make sure that the German would open up his over overcoat or whatever coat he had on and we did find some of them carrying hand grenades and their, du their duty and job was to see how many of those soldiers, American soldiers, they could kill. So we marched them down to the rear to a certain distance where other military patrol MPs took over and they took the thousands of soldiers that we had captured as a result of General Patton's thrust, armored thrust. Some of those guys that had those overcoats open up, you could see the hand grenades. Are they now resting in peace in France? Yes. Yes. The American soldiers, once they realized that you can't be a good guy, and they, even though they were going to be treated very well by the American Army. They took out some of our men and the, some of the soldiers became very agitated and, and had no sympathy for these fellows and shot them for self-protection. Sure. Yeah. Uh, now, General Patton used to come up in his jeep and he would be standing up with his uh, leather leggings, his riding boots and his two white handle, ivory handle pistols and shouting at the troops, good job, good job, keep going, don't stop, don't stop. So we did have to stop and we would bivouac in certain areas. And uh, I remember going into a place in Belgium called Liège. And the thing that I remember about Belgium was how close it was to America. The buildings were similar to ours, and so many of the Belgian people spoke English. I didn't remember anybody not that the Belgian. They, they had a, a language of their own. It wasn't. It was Flemish and French. They had their own language, 
but they spoke English and they, they were very, very generous to us, the Belgian people.